So we're out here in the middle of nowhere, what some people would call the middle of nowhere. Others would call it the middle of everywhere. Desolate as it may seem, people have been living here for thousands of years, long before the historic copper mine, and uh, thriving out here, passing through the area, traveling through this area. We have prehistoric routes, travel ways, and the Southern Paiute people, this is their homelands. Shivwitz Paiute, um, they've been out here, and they'll say, since time immemorial. We've been here forever. And it was actually a Southern Paiute individual who showed the copper ore, the first piece of copper ore, to the earliest people who were looking for copper on the Arizona Strip. The earliest mining efforts were in the late 1800s, and uh, copper mining is a real boom and bust uh, business because the price of copper depends on the national market or the international market. So you'll see a, a copper mine going uh, big business and then it'll just bust. And then it'll start up again next time the market uh, gets real good for copper. And at its peak, there were anywhere from 30 to 80 people working here and living here. The real boom was spurred on by World War I, the need for copper then, and the electrification of America, basically. When you're actually in a mine tunnel and you're trying to get ore out, typically what you're doing is you're trying to break it up, which usually means drilling holes into it and then blasting it. So early mining was all done with hand tools hand drills where you're just slamming on this thing with a sledgehammer, either a single jack or a double jack, basically just means one or two heads on the thing. It's what we call hard rock mining, and uh, that's a real good description. Very hard rock, very hard work. Drilling the hole, putting in the blasting powder, and then blasting the rock out so you can then haul it out. Ultimately, they did develop uh, mechanized drills. There, you could drill the holes a lot quicker, but the amount of dust generated in doing this in this hard rock mining, you end up with uh, you know, ailments later in your life. White lung, they call it. You know, the, the dust gets in your lungs and just kills you ultimately. 500 feet below the ground uh, is a network of tunnels uh, from getting, for getting the copper ore out of the ground keep those tunnels uh, intact. You had to shore them up with timbers. The timbers came from the mountains east of here, um, which coincidentally was where the timbers for the Latter-day Saints Temple in St. George also came from. My grandfather actually came over from Italy and worked in coal mines in northern New Mexico, and that was his job was to put in the safety timbers, the shoring, and keep the mine safe. You had hoists to bring the ore up out, uh, rails to move the ore to where it could be hoisted out. Uh, sometimes, depending, you'd have a you know, mule actually pull in the ore cart uh, coming through. Uh, and the earliest hoists were, again, horse-powered or mule-powered to pull that to the surface. And then later, they did go to mechanized hoists. Mines are really enticing and intriguing and people want to explore them, but they were dangerous back then, uh, even with brand new timbering and shoring and uh, people working to keep them safe. Now all those timbers are rotted or burned out, uh, fallen down, collapsed. So definitely not a safe place to be. When it comes to a mine, stay out, stay alive. Once you get to the ore to the surface, then you have to get it where you can process it. And so the early days, that was uh, burrow loads or freight wagons. Uh, ultimately, they went to uh, mule trains with uh, wagons and uh, tremendous cost because we're in the middle of nowhere here. And back then it was bam, 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 mile after mile. And you can literally find old wagon routes by bits and pieces that fell off. The wagons literally were falling apart. You can still travel what was a prehistoric route, a historic route, this mine route, the ore route. You can travel that now in the comfort of a Razor or a UTV or a pickup truck. 
And if you break down out here in the summertime, you're gonna know real quick just how brutal this place can be. Going across with the wagon trains, you would go spring to spring, maybe have, you literally have to stash grass or hay for the mules to eat along the way, because again, hot stinking desert. There's not that much out to eat out there. You just gotta keep moving kind of thing. You can see where the old uh, wagon train would sign in on the rocks with axle grease. A tremendous amount of effort. Uh, get across the desert uh, through tight canyon narrows and then the final obstacle of crossing the Virgin River which you know on a good day you splish splash on across. On a bad day you end up washed away and uh, the irony of drowning in the desert and all just to get to St. Thomas, Nevada where it could be loaded on a train. Then it would go by rail to Salt Lake City, Utah where it would be processed. So that ore is still there, sitting right there in St. Thomas, Nevada, waiting to be loaded on the train. You can go there and visit it. It's a Park Service interpretive site and uh, Lake Mead National Recreation Area. Imagine what it was like all those years ago, uh, living there, uh, working there. Uh, you can walk the streets, look at the old buildings and imagine living in the desert there. Tremendously hot in the summertime, surprisingly cold in the wintertime. Uh, a lot of these desert towns, these little farm towns, their nicknames sometimes are more illustrative of the real life conditions. Uh, there's one called Lick Skillet. In other words, you didn't have much left over. Uh, never Sweat. And that, of course, is a, a sort of a satirical comment on just how hot it is. But the town's days were numbered. Um, the newly constructed Hoover Dam uh, flooded out the community, the rising waters of Lake Mead put the town in a watery grave. However, now with uh, fluctuating lake levels, you can actually see the community as it's been resurrected and exposed by the lower lake water levels. The old buildings here at Grand Gulf Mine really tell the human story of this place. Uh, bunkhouse, mess hall, cookhouse, uh, really let you think about how it was living here once you got out of the mine, you know, the hard work of the day. Uh, you know, first you had to get clean. Um, some places they would actually have a, like a shower house or a bath house where you could get cleaned up. A lot of times, if you didn't have that much water, you just kind of wiped yourself off and went on about your day after that. Um, the artifacts on a historic site, the cans, the bottles, those will tell that story as well. Um, you find toys on historic sites and then that gets you thinking, okay, there were kids here. Um, you know, what, what, what is the story behind each and, each and every artifact? So what were people eating here? Well, the artifacts, the tin cans and the bottles down the slope, they would tell us, you know, were they drinking cocoa? Were they drinking tea? Were they drinking coffee? Those tins are gonna be down the slope there. They'll tell us that story. And because you had wagons going to St. Thomas hauling ore, well, when they would come back, they wouldn't come back empty. They'd get fresh produce from the St. Thomas farming community. The melons from St. Thomas were a real treat out here in the middle of nowhere. Um, if you needed beef, they had an arrangement with the ranchers where when they needed uh, meat, they wouldn't go to the butcher. They would just shoot a cow out here, butcher it out here, pay the rancher after the fact. So even though this mine's in the middle of nowhere, the holidays were important. Uh, there's a newspaper account, 1912, of the big Thanksgiving dinner hosted by the mine superintendent. Everybody had a great feast. Um, Christmas time and uh, the old areas around here, a real treat was getting a Christmas orange because they had to be purchased so far away and traveled so far and you got your very own special Christmas orange. 
there was a community here. It wasn't just miners in the middle of nowhere. Women were prohibited from working in or even entering the mine, but they were still here and they fulfilled traditional roles, mending clothing, cooking, and cleaning. There was a Paiute woman who was the cook, Susie Pulsifer, I don't know her Paiute name, um, and her two little girls were here with her. So one would expect to see toys out here. Um, same thing, uh, nice hair pins, that sort of thing. So it's like, even though you're in the middle of nowhere, you're still living. You're still wanting to enjoy things. So when you visit historic sites, it's the artifacts and the buildings that tell the whole story. Uh, real important to uh, look at things, but don't disturb them. Don't destroy them. Don't take them because the next person, they won't be able to get that same story. The information will be lost. They're, everything's protected by law on historic sites, and uh, we need to respect the past, preserve it for the future. <laughs>